Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Documents in Detail webinar for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. The focus of tonight's program was Daniel Patrick Moynihan's document, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, drawn from our Slavery and Its Consequences Core Documents Collection. As always, we were joined by Dr. John Moser, Professor of History at Ashland University, as well as Dr. David Tucker, Senior Fellow at the Ashbrook Center and the editor of the Slavery and Its Consequences volume, and Dr. Peter Myers of the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser. I am Professor of History and Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University. And I would like to welcome you to another episode of Documents in Detail, Teaching American History's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically important documents. We encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the Q&A box, please not the chat box. We'd like for all the questions to be in one place. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Within the next week, You'll be receiving an email with a link to request a certificate of participation if you would like one. Uh, that email will also contain a link to the archived video and audio from tonight's program. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from the various volumes in our core document series. They are also available at the Ashbrook Center's voluminous document database located at tah.org. The subject of tonight's program comes from the volume on slavery and its consequences edited by David Tucker. The document in question is Daniel Patrick Moynihan's The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. And to help discuss it are Dr. Tucker himself, he is senior fellow at the Ashbrook Center, as well as Dr. Peter Myers, professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Both of these gentlemen are faculty members in Ashland University's master's program in American history and government. Welcome to both of you. Hi, John. Peter. <clears throat> Hello, all. So I always like to kick this off by asking a very general question. Uh, what is it about this document that is, makes it significant enough to merit inclusion in the core document series? Well, uh, this is an interesting case because Pete did the, uh, the volume on civil rights and he included it in that volume as well. So I, I, Pete, why don't you go ahead and explain why you included it in yours if you, if you want well, to know. You know, I mean, as, as I was looking over this again, um, in preparation for tonight, it it um, it jumped out at me the thought that uh, this is really a much more significant document even than I thought before, and I thought it I always thought it was. And what I mean in saying that is that it seems to me that um, Moynihan's not alone in saying this, but this is. Um, this is the, in a way, the exemplary document that announces a break in the course of the civil rights movement. That there, you know, Martin Luther King says this also, there are two different phases of it, and one of them comes to an end with the Voting Rights Act, which is what Moynihan says and what LBJ says in the speech that Moynihan apparently wrote for him. Um, but um, the, the significance of that break, the transition from phase one to phase two is really momentous. And Moynihan's suggestions of what needs to be done in phase two, and phase two is still with us. Phase two is pretty much um, a set of problems that have been persistent problems throughout the whole post-civil rights era, the past uh, more, than, more than half century. Um, and, um, and I think, Moynihan's, Moynihan's analysis of it prefigures a lot of things for better and for worse that are arguments that are still with us. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that as, a, as an intro. Um, I, I think what Pete said is true with regard to the civil rights movement, and I included it in Slavery and Its Consequences because it seemed to me that it, it, it goes 
the, the issues that Moynihan's talking about go back to reconstruction and the question of, do we simply guarantee legal rights and legal protections through the courts for American citizens? I mean, the case within reconstruction is the freedmen or with regard to um, African-Americans later on then and, and later on, does more have to be done? And Moynihan raises this question by pointing to slavery and he makes an argument <clears throat> that American slavery was particularly bad. And, and that's a major part of his explanation for the continuing problems that he's addressing. So I think it's, it's, it has that broad, certainly for the civil rights movement, but, but beyond that as well, it's significant. That in what way? He, he draws the parallel to, to Brazil, where he points out that slavery lasted 20 years longer than it did in the United States. What was it that was so pernicious about American slavery? Well, uh, I didn't actually check Pete's excerpting of the document. He may have done a better job, but when I was looking at the entire document, I felt that my excerpt, I, I probably should have included at least a little bit about his statement that the key issue in American slavery is that it's chattel slavery. In other words, the the personhood, if you want to use that term, of of slaves in America was not recognized. And he claims that's different. It was different in Brazil. Um, I noted in the introduction to the document that I don't think that the way Moynihan, Moynihan was basing his book, his understanding of slavery on a book that I think no scholar of slavery now would accept as being completely accurate. In fact, I, I, I don't think it's, it's viewed as being very accurate at all. So I think that's that's an issue um, with regard to how he talks about uh, American slavery. It's clear, I, and the difference is that the more people have studied slavery, I think the more they have seen that the uh, wh whether you look at African American religion or you just look at the way under some circumstances uh, the people who were held in in uh, slavery could uh, negotiate or maneuver. So there seems to have, it's not the quite the way, I would say more than not quite, it's not the way that Moynihan uh, thought he, uh, the way he understood it based on Elkin's book. Peter. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I would uh, add, a, add a couple of things that um, I think um, Moynihan's, Moynihan's presentation of slavery the, the, the powerful effect that slavery had. Well, let me, let me say a couple of things. Uh, I guess just drawing from the, the discussion in, in the text of the Moynihan Report. Uh, and by the way, I, no, I wasn't any better an editor than, uh, than you were, David, on, on that. I, I, didn't, I didn't include the part about, uh, uh, about the comparison with, uh, with Brazilian slavery. But he makes an interesting point uh, to the effect that uh, the, the Brazilian regime is influenced by, uh, a, by, a, by a Catholic heritage. Um, by, and, uh, and, and what he draws out of that is that there's a certain, it's almost a medieval sort of hierarchy of stations in society uh, that, that go, of course, go from high to low, but everybody has their place and everybody has at least a certain um, a certain degree, a certain measure of rights uh, proper to their place. And so he's trying to make the point that, that people who were enslaved in Brazil were recognized as human and had, uh, you know, and had uh, a, a small core of rights. Whereas he says, because of the fact that in the Anglo-American tradition, Slavery isn't recognized, I mean, in the tradition of jurisprudence and political thought, slavery isn't recognized as a legitimate relation, then, uh, um, then those enslaved had to be considered altogether outside, not just political society, but really outside humanity. And I'm, I'm not sure this is a fully persuasive argument, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the argument he makes. That in, and it's not unique to him, that in some sense is the virtue of the Anglo-American tradition 
that forces a more virulent kind of racism if you're going to accommodate the existence of slavery within it, then the people enslaved have to be defined as, as subhuman. Um, and, and, and that at least I think is the argument that he's, that he's hinting at. But then to, to just to add one further, I guess really it's just a note of emphasis to what, to what David said. Um, the, 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 the conception of the, the presentation of American slavery as uniquely bad is I think now contested. I don't know that I would present myself as an expert in this literature, but the, the further point related to that, but distinct is that he's, he's saying that it was, he's making a point not about its, not only about its intrinsic moral character as uniquely bad, He's making a point about its unique effectiveness in dehumanizing the people who are subject to it and, and essentially you know, converting them to brutes, brutalizing them. And uh, that I think is the part especially that's been dismissed by or rejected by more, by more recent scholarship. And I, I found myself you know, kind of muttering to myself when I was reading that again from Moynihan that, I mean, had he, had he gone over just a few a few autobiographical slave narratives, he would have understood that slavery did not break the people. It was, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that suffered under it. It did terrible things to them, but they weren't broken. They weren't left helpless and spiritless as a, as a consequence. And I think his suggestion that it did have those effects um, is fraught with consequences with regard to how he wants to approach the problem in the 1960s. Yeah, I, I, John, if you don't mind, I, I just want to add, I, I think there's a little bit of historical irony in that the way Moynihan de depicts Brazil is the kind of argument that was used to justify slavery. In other words, you know, a kind of corporatist understanding of society, everybody has their place and the dignity of people, you know, better than wage slavery in the North. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's almost that kind of argument. So it's, it's a kind of odd, when I, when I was rereading it, I was struck by that, thinking it's kind of an odd way of defending or, th or thinking about slavery. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the context in which this, uh, this, this document appeared. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is law. The Voting Rights Act, not yet passed, but appearing likely that it will. Um, the riots of the of, of 1960s have yet to appear, correct? Those would have been summer of 65 would have been the first. Uh, the that, well, that's when they broke out in in bigger numbers. But right. uh, but there was a was it Harlem? Uh, right. in, in 1964, there right. was already some, you know, kind of foreboding here. Mm -hmm. Watch yeah. 65. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's what right. else? What else could, could you say about the uh, about the the situation in the United States at the time that that uh, Moynihan was writing this? Uh, I think one thing that it's Im important to remember, and it, when especially looking at Moynihan's uh, at the statistics he used and so forth, is that the economy is growing. Um, there was a you know in the last years of the. I our administration, I guess it's 58, there's a recession. It wasn't you know, very deep, but there was a recession and the economy recovers. And then because of tax cuts, Vietnam spending, you know, the economy's booming. So that a lot of the economic data that he talks about looking back is actually changing even as he's writing uh, his report. And it, it takes a while for the, you know, for the statistics and their analysis to catch up with what's actually happening in the economy. So that um, that's something that's in flux and changing uh, as he's as he's writing the report. Um, another thing I would mention is that it's and Pete may know more about this than I do, but it's my understanding that uh, maybe not every civil rights leader, but lots of civil rights leaders dislike the Moynihan report a lot because it, one reason was because with the passage of the civil uh, uh, the Voting Rights Act, they wanted to focus on voting rights, um, thinking that would would help. And it, you know, I mean, to some degree, 
it did, but but they had a lot of invested in carrying through on that. And so they some people in the civil rights movement saw Moynihan's report as a distraction in a way. Um, and it, it was not uh, received a lot of criticism uh, from civil rights groups and from other people. Peter. Oh, I guess I would just, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything David said. And uh, I would just um, make a point uh, connected, John, with the way you introduced it, that I, th I think the, the outbreak of, of rioting added a degree, a very significant degree of urgency to the whole thing. And Moynihan uh, maybe was reacting to that or maybe just you know, was farsighted enough to see that this is the way the next phase of the civil rights movement was gonna, uh, uh, this is the direction it was going to take, that it was gonna start to, it was gonna have a much greater concern with socioeconomic outcomes because that's, I mean, this has been something that Bayard Rustin had suggested for, for some time. And even, even uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had suggested this in the aftermath of the, the Birmingham and the March on Washington campaigns that this was going to be the next, uh, the, the next direction of the movement, but it was, um, the urgency of it, I think, was really underscored. Again, I think you one would have to add for better and for worse as a consequence of the riots. I mean, King had been saying for years and years and years, um, we need change right now. You know, the, the one book is entitled Why We Can't Wait and, uh, and the dream speech is full of uh, 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 invocations of the fierce urgency of now and, and like sentiments. Um, and King wanted to proceed uh, just as, as, as quickly, I guess, uh, in the second phase of the movement. And the rioting, I think, put that thought in a lot of people's heads that, uh, that we have to do something right now or else the, the, the country really is gonna, is gonna blow up. I, I wonder if it isn't also relevant that March of 1965, they, 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 They've just come off one of the greatest electoral landslides in history, right? Mm -hmm. Linda Johnson is absolutely riding high in early uh, early 1965. It, it it would seem to me this is the time for uh, for bold initiatives. Right? Well, yeah, I think in Johnson's view, from what I understand of that history, uh, it it certainly was. The, but but for him, the bold initiative was he wanted to build. The, the great society kind of as a, as, as, a, as a large enterprise. And he didn't want to focus immediately on the, on the racial questions and he was pushed into it partly by the, by the Medgar Evers murder and, uh, and then uh, uh, and by continued activism from, uh, from King uh, and, uh, and King's associates. And he wanted to, I mean, so, he, so in a way he sort of felt pushed to, uh, to push through the Voting Rights Act in the summer of 1965. Uh, and then here, I think the, uh, the, the initiative is that he finally wants to get out in front of the, of the civil rights movement. I guess this maybe speaks to the point, I hadn't thought of it before, that, that David made, that they, uh, that they wanted to focus on voting rights. Um, but um, Johnson wanted to finally be not reactive to them, but actually have something that looks like it's on its own initiative. And so I think that's, that's part of the reason why he likes the Moynihan report and makes it uh, uh, a, a cause of action from, uh, for, you know, as, a, um, as, a, as, a kind of, as it becomes kind of the centerpiece of the war on poverty. I, I think another part of the context is the, amb is, uh, the ambition of Moynihan and Johnson. Uh, Moynihan is, he gets, he, he's, he's working, he was hired, uh, he's an academic, he published a book, uh, Beyond the Melting Pot, that came out in 63, I believe, and then he, he goes into the government and he goes into the Labor Department and, and part of the war on poverty. This report, he was head of the policy planning office, this report would not normally be part of the Labor Department. I guess you could say, well, it's, you know, it mentions employment and unemployment, so therefore it is. Uh, but he he wants to make a mark, and he gets the report 
to the White House through his connections. He's a, uh, himself a, a very, you know, as his Senate career uh, indicates, a good politician and he knows people and that sort of thing. So he gets it to the White House and it becomes part of the, really the, the background of the speech that <clears throat> Johnson gives. Uh, freedom, freedom is not enough. You know, we have to go on for uh, pressing the case for equal rights. And I think Johnson was, you know, his ambition was to surpass FDR. Uh, so I think that the ambition of these two people is, uh, is important to keep in mind. It, it's really breathtaking that, you know, that we read some of LBJ's speeches and what he says about the, the scope of the actions that he wants the federal government to take, the magnitude of the problems that he's confident they can solve with uh, with federal programs. Uh, is some of that, some of that confidence seems to me that it's in it's in Moynihan too. You know, there, there's a uh, maybe it, it's a part of the spirit of the age that there's a that social scientists believe that they really could engineer solutions to social problems if they had the right the right empirical arguments underlying them. And uh, Moynihan seems to think well. Moynihan. I, I credit him, I, maybe I should credit him more than that. I mean, Moynihan, Moynihan seems to have a certain degree of skepticism or a bit of just questioning. I don't know whether any of this is gonna work, but we gotta, we gotta do something. He certainly became, um, as others did, more skeptical of, of government action in this, in this realm. But, you know, I mean, I, 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 Eisenhower used to say, uh, you can't change people's attitudes by passing laws, um, which <laughs> I was rereading Plessy for another purpose a couple of weeks ago, and that's actually in the Plessy, the majority <laughs> opinion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is kind of, I was kind of shocked by that. So, but I mean, that's clearly not the attitude of, of the Kennedy and Johnson administration. They, they are out to change things. So there really is a whole different context in the way of thinking about government action, uh, what it can accomplish and, and, it's, and, and the, um, the ends it can, uh, it should pursue. All right, let's, uh, let's turn to some questions from our viewers. Uh, Joe Rooney asks, in chapter two, Moynihan links the disintegration of the African-American family to slavery, but he compares urban working class African-American families to what appears to be data about middle class whites. How would the urban African-American family compare to urban Irish or Italian or German Jewish families from Southwest and Southeast DC, for example? In other words, are the urban and class distinctions more significant than race? Um, that's, that's a really good question. And it's, it was one of the questions that was raised about the report very early on, in fact, by people inside uh, Moynihan's staff uh, who said, look, the real, the real if, if, if you um, analyze the statistics, if you normalize them, if that's the right statistical term for income, you find that not all, but, but the disparities decrease significantly. So these really seem to be problems that, that would lead you to say these are problems more of poverty than of race, um, which doesn't deny that their that their discrimination and racism uh, is not part of the problem, but it 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 points rather to the the economic issue, uh, jobs uh, and and the state of the economy, and of course, you know the. The access to jobs is in part a question of uh, ingrained habits and racism, which leads employers to simply not regard, uh, in some cases, regard African Americans as imaginable employees for certain kinds of work. So I think that is a question. Uh, it was a question very early uh, on raised about the report whether the statistical analysis really supported the emphasis on race or, or whether it, it really pointed to economic problems at least being at least as important and maybe more important in some ways. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Uh, again, I, my congratulations to the questioner. That's good. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to give you a really solidly empirically grounded answer, but a couple of a couple of thoughts about that. Um, one is that I think um, Moynihan maybe maybe could have anticipated 
or tried harder to anticipate the reaction that was going to come to the report. Um, and had he done so, he might not have been quite so so sanguine about uh, almost kind of blasé about the the effect of certain social trends on white Americans' family stability, because he does notice a few times that instability, you know, family dissolution is, is happening in white America, but he just says, you know, based on a much smaller base and to a much smaller degree. And he doesn't break that down with regard to ethnic groups. He comes from, you know, a sort of semi-broken, you know, urbanized Irish family. I think that's part of the reason why he's interested in these kinds of issues in the yeah. first place. I'm a little, you know, I would be, you know, happy to be, uh, to be corrected if I'm wrong about this. I, the, the groups that you mentioned, that the questioner mentions, um, I doubt would have shown the same kind of incidence of family dissolution just because they were, I think, in, in those days especially, they're influenced by the Catholic tradition and that, that that's going to have a certain, a certain um, cohering effect. On, on marriages. But that said, um, I think, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you can say that this family dissolution issue is a very large American cultural problem. And it, it really isn't. Uh, it's a problem that has affected Black America the earliest and the most intensively. But it's um, the statistics about um, the rate of out of wedlock births, as we now say, Moynihan used the term illegitimacy. Um, those statistics today are about 40% nationwide of all births are born to, uh, to single mothers. And, and uh, Moynihan was alarmed for black America when that number reached 25%. And, and um, so, I mean, I don't think that's, that's not urbanized whites now, it's more rural whites where you see that problem. And, and there is a big class divide uh, um, there too, so it's useful to call attention to that. But the class divide, I'm not sure, really applies to Black America the same way it would have in 1965. I mean, the rate is the rate's very high. Uh, I mean, it's about 75 percent among Black Americans at the present day, and so that that clearly does cut across class lines. This gets us to a question that I wanted to get to eventually, anyhow how well does this analysis hold up in light of more recent trends? Uh, my, my take is that what Peter's talking about is, is what's, um, is the real issue. I, I was reading, a, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, I was reading an account by a black Marxist of this kind of stuff. I mean, one, one thing that Moynihan's report did was it generated a lot of scholarship about the black family and about conditions of African Americans after Reconstruction, and and that's a very I, I you know that it, there's a lot of it of that research now, and I don't as Peter was saying I don't claim to be a master of the empirical details, but um, I think overall the the real issue is the structure. I guess I would say that the the black the Af the black Marxist was was saying the real issue is the structure of the economy, and I I'm laughing because I found myself agreeing with him. You know, I thought, well, if I read this book, I'll be saying, oh, this guy's crazy. But I'm saying, yeah, I think you're right. You know, and he goes through some of the data to show that what was happening to black families, Moynihan says it's in the early '60s, started to happen more frequently to white families in the early '70s. And and it's the it, you know you can use the term deindustrialization or you know. But, but there's a change in the structure of the economy and people who have limited educational opportunities, and that would apply obviously to, to African-Americans uh, for, for much of their history in the country. Um, that is gonna be a problem because, you know, brawn is no longer the issue in a service economy. It's uh, your um, ability to manipulate symbols, which is a question of, to some degree, obviously a question of the amount of education you have. So. Um, I, I was actually persuaded by reading, I, I don't agree with his solutions to the problem, I have to say, but mm -hmm. I was persuaded by him that, yeah, the, he, that's really the underlying issue is an economic one and the structure of the economy. And now we see it affecting not just African Americans, but uh, white Americans, as Peter was pointing out. Yeah, I guess, um, 
your question was how how well does it hold up the Moynihan the Moynihan analysis and um, you know the point that I was making is building on the point that David was making. Um, you find like in a book like Charles Murray's book, The Coming Apart book, uh, that where he's really he's really focused on a a, a, a growing uh, underclass uh, among white Americans and. Um, you know, characterized by by family disorganization and uh, and some problems. You know, some you could call them pathologies in uh, in cultural mores and things like that. Um, when so so Moynihan's confidence that this is a that this is a racial problem or a, a, a kind of distinctly racial problem, I think, has not really held up very well. It certainly is, as we say, a problem that, uh, that, that applies more, more severely and intensively among Black Americans, at least for the moment. But, uh, um, but it, is a, it is a problem, at least among, well, it's a problem among white Americans and Hispanic Americans, not so much yet among Asian Americans, but a couple of generations down the road. We'll, 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 see, we'll see about that. Uh, so, that's one thing. The, there's a corollary to that, that his, his singling out of, um, of the, 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 the plight of, uh, of, of Black America is based on what we were talking about earlier, this, the, the unique evil, unique badness of, uh, of slavery, and more generally, the uniqueness, the exceptional character of the, the Black American experience, I think, leads him to de-emphasize the remedies that have been, um, or to discount um, remedies that have been remedies for other groups who haven't faced the kind of injustices the Blacks have, but have faced their own injustices. And so the, the, the formula for success you know, the success sequence, as you see it sometimes discussed to th these days, uh, Moynihan ignores completely. And he, he comes away from his analysis of slavery, rendering this picture of, of complete black brokenness and helplessness. Um, and so therefore the only salvation for them is action that comes from groups or agencies external to them, which in his case is going to be, you know, as he says, national policy, the federal, federal government. And at the same time, he's not really sure that he knows any, any policy that's going to rebuild the family that he thinks is, uh, is the core of the problem. So in that way, and I think, you know, in that way, his, his, um, it's, it's almost kind of a desperate faith that there's going to be a policy solution for this has not has not held up very well. John, could, could I offer just a quick note, another historical irony. So beginning, you know, before the First World War, but but during the First World War and afterwards, there's this large migration north and west of blacks out of the south. Uh, primarily because they can get better jobs, which they do. Um, and then that increases after this or continues after the Second World War, but it's after the Second World War by the, you know, even by the late 50s that the economic structure is changing and industry is now starting to move to the South. Uh, and, and over time, Blacks, I mean, now there's a movement of Blacks back to the South because that's mm -hmm. the more dynamic area uh, of the country economically. So there's that large scale pattern that's going on and, and Moynihan is picking out a particular moment and focusing on it. I mean, in a way you could say, how could he, I mean, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It was a problem. I mean, there were problems that he was trying to understand, but um, there, there is that larger pattern of, of movement. And, and it's, um, you know, again, you know, even in the 50s, Northern senators and politicians were talking about the, the decline of manufacturing and, you know, so forth. And that was impacting um, African Americans as well as, as whites. Uh, this question from an anonymous attendee, are, are you arguing that the effective resistance of those enslaved 
is somehow testament to the fact that slavery was not that bad in America, hmm. or that our nation's institution of slavery was about as bad as everybody else's, so it's not unique. What scholarship are you referring to that disputes the perniciousness of our institution? Uh, I, uh, well, uh, this is always a problem when you talk about this, because uh, to say that Moynihan is wrong about it doesn't mean you're saying that it wasn't pernicious, evil, harmful, didn't have any effects, et cetera, et cetera. The issue is rather understanding the, the complex set of causes and effects um, that, that bear on the kinds of problems he was talking about. If, uh, if the person is interested in reading some of the scholarship in the back of slavery and its consequences, there's suggestions for further reading. And, um, I, and I mentioned in the, in the um, article uh, in the document, the, the Moynihan document, uh, at least one of the books that, that I think gives a, a, a better sense of what slavery was, was, was like. Peter Colchin's book is a good yeah. book. Um, you know, um, I, I mentioned uh, Ira Berlin, I believe, is the person I mentioned in the, in the um, document. Those are just two, but there's others back there, and they don't all take the same view of slavery. So I don't think Pete, neither Pete nor I are arguing that slavery wasn't a terrible thing and didn't do serious damage to people. Uh, the question is trying to understand that in the context of a, of a you know, a, a, a complex socioeconomic um, situation and, and trying to understand how to weigh causes and effects and, and to understand the problem so that it could be dealt with which was ultimately what Moynihan was trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's in the same spirit as uh, how, I would, how I would respond. Yeah, I, I don't want to be understood and not be incorrectly understood to say that, uh, that American slavery was somehow not that bad or, uh, or a more benign kind of slavery than, uh, than other forms of slavery. Um, I, I think it's a mistake either way. I think it's 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 a mistake to say it was it was uniquely by orders of magnitude awful, much more terrible than other kinds of slavery. People in slavery have always done horrible things to each to each other, and there's of course a long history of that. I think we need to uh, and, and as for the as for the, the the comparison of American slavery with other forms. Again, I, I was I, I stepped up for a minute because I was looking for I was trying to remember the name of the Peter Colton book that uh, uh, that David mentioned, which which also um, presents some evidence for this proposition that there are things uniquely bad about uh, about U.S. slavery. The racializing of it is uh, is probably um, the prominent among those, and uh, uh, and the the um, the, the creation of the concept of really legal chattel, the deprivation of, uh, of, uh, of the opportunity for education, literacy, these, these, are, these are very bad things. On the other hand, um, the, you, can, you can see on, on other modes of comparing it, um, mortality rates among American slaves, at least around the founding era, were not as high as they were in the in the Caribbean, and this is a fact you know because some of the founders thought some of the founders were quite optimistic about uh, James Wilson, for instance, about the fact that they wrote into the Constitution uh, an opportunity within a couple of decades to uh, to prohibit the, the 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 slave trade, the importation of slaves. They thought doing that was going to mean the eventual abolition of slavery um, because they thought that the mortality rate was exceeding the birth rate. So if you confine slavery just to the domestic population, the population of slaves is going to shrink over generations. I mean, because they were estimating the severity of slavery in that way. But it turned out that they were misjudging the case based on the really high mortality rates in the in the West Indies and Caribbean, which really did depend on uh, on the foreign slave trade to sustain itself as an institution. Um, 
but American slavery didn't depend on that because birth rates are higher. So that doesn't mean American slavery was benign. It means that there's this, there's this, there's this marginal difference. I, would, I was making a point more about the resiliency of the human nature of the people who were enslaved. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I mean, when you, when you read you know, Frederick Douglass's autobiography above all, but he's not the only example, um, it becomes a very important point to them to make the argument that we were not, yes, we were brutalized, yes, we were treated terribly, yes, this is a grotesque injustice, but we were not broken. Um, and so we were not just objects that were liberated by other people. We took our fate into our hands uh, and we weren't broken in spirit. Yes, we acted submissively, and Moynihan makes this point about the effects of slavery and segregation, that it's turned blacks into, uh, especially black males, it's emasculated them, it's made them kind of submissive. And, uh, and Douglas's point is that that's absolutely not true. You know, it, we, we, well, we like to appear submissive, um, but that's, that's esoteric, um, you know, that the, the there's, a, there's a great spiritedness uh, and, and Jefferson saw that. I mean, you know, Jefferson, for all his faults in racial analysis, understood when he said that, uh, you know, here's why integration won't work, is that there are going to be 10,000 recollections of injustice on the part of the Blacks, is one of the things he says, along with the deep-rooted white prejudices. Um, you know, that, that's a commentary that, that Jefferson knows very well that uh, the people enslaved that he's, you know, that he knows of, are not beaten into submission. I mean, they're they're angry and they're capable of resistance. And and that I think is is more the that that's more the point that Moynihan is is overlooking. Um, and again, it has it has policy consequences. I, I would like to point to one thing, maybe one specific way to follow this argument. So this is on. Um, I don't know if people have. I, I've got the volume here. This is chapter four called the Tangle of Pathology. There's a footnote there because um, Moynihan is saying the federal government has contributed to the problems we face because of the way it's done housing. It's discriminated against uh, African Americans. That's important because the argument is that when uh, African Americans moved north, they moved into cities, and because of housing discrimination, they were in a sense trapped in these cities. So the connection here is slavery in America is racial, gives rise to a, a, a powerful um, prejudice against African Americans. The government uh, institutionalizes that, which leads to uh, housing difficulties uh, for African Americans, which in turn affects their ability to um, move, to get better jobs, et cetera. So you can trace that kind of chain, but the question is always uh, understanding uh, how, how important those different items I just mentioned are in the story that Moynihan thinks he sees. And, and the key thing is that Moynihan recognizes, which was true, there is a black middle class. If, 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 if racial prejudice is the cause of uh, the, what he calls pathologies, then you would think they would be universal or more universal, but how is there this middle class? So it's clear there's other things going on that we have to try, or Moynihan, I think I would say in terms of John's question about how is it stood up, uh, Moynihan should have done a better job trying to understand um, and other scholars, historians, political scientists, sociologists have spent a lot of time since um, trying to do that. Can I make one further point here? Um, this is uh, calling attention to a mistake. It's maybe a rhetorical mistake, or maybe it's a mistake in at a deeper level of understanding uh, that I think um, Moynihan, Moynihan, I think, identified with the people he was writing about. You know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, he, he came from disadvantaged circumstances. He came from circumstances which his own family was kind of broken. The Irish have a, their own history of being regarded as, uh, um, as, uh, as a, a lesser kind of people uh, in 19th century America. And I think he's, he's sensitive to that. And I think the fact that he feels 
a certain degree of identification with Black Americans who are ghettoized in the, in the mid 20th century, maybe has a little bit of a blinding effect on him. Uh, meaning that I think it maybe has the effect of persuading him that he can say certain things in public without doing offense. Uh, what, uh, I mean, one of the things I encounter when I'm preparing for this is that, uh, you know, Moynihan, Moynihan's analysis, he says this in the, in the report itself, is not really that original. It's, he, he thinks that he's presenting the results of, uh, of social science research and the social science research he's drawing upon is, is by, by black scholars. He, he, he mentions E. Franklin Frazier uh, uh, several times. Um, he mentions uh, um, <laughs> Kenneth Clark. I was forgetting his first name for a second. Kenneth Clark, who's the author of the phrase Tangle of Pathology. And I think Moynihan is just a little obtuse um, in thinking that a, a white professor, you know, bureaucrat, scholar can say these things in public um, because they are, uh, they're, they're bec uh, um, be because, because black scholars have, have already said them and, um, and not get a lot of blowback. From, about it, I, I think he, he needed to have a little more a little more sensitivity about that, and you can see some of the the reaction by the civil rights leaders. Uh, I think maybe has, I mean, registers that kind of that kind of offense. That these are things that you know that we we recognize and we'll talk about among ourselves, but we're not going to be lectured by by white authorities about them. Um, Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself. Um, this next question is, is a little bit related to the previous one. What scholars do you feel made have made the strongest arguments addressing the connection and causal relationship between race and socioeconomic status? Uh, Joanna Wasili asked this question and admits that she is fishing for resources to help explore that aspect. Any particular recommendations? Well, I'm going to out myself a little bit when I uh, when I said, but to me, I mean, the, the the name that comes to mind first and foremost is Thomas Sowell, uh, who's who's uh, controversial, I know, but uh, but but Thomas Sowell says things about race and culture um, that uh, and and draws upon a wealth of empirical uh, investigation. Uh, it just he just says things that others that others don't say, so. That's a that's a place to start. I think um, I think you should you should read William Julius Wilson, even though I I, I think um, some um, some of his conclusions have been contested by my lights effectively by others. But he's he's an important writer. William Julius Wilson, Harvard University Chicago sociologist. Um, Orlando Patterson is a, a wonderful sociologist who has. Who's written a lot of things and um, and is is hard to categorize ideologically. He's uh, he's a very independent thinker. So I those those authors I would recommend. You can I can think of others, but I don't want to go on and on about that. David, you would add? Um, no, I can't. I can't think of any others that I would add at the moment. I think a, a lot of the stuff that's been most interesting to me shows up in. Kind of, unfortunately, kind of obscure uh, places. In other words, studies of suburbanization among African Americans in the 70s and 80s, and or and these are you know detailed statistical studies, which I often end up staring at blankly because I'm not a statistician. But I mean, in those articles, there's a lot of and there's ongoing debate about every single question. I would say that Moynihan raised about these about these issues. Um, but I think in terms of having a framework for talking about it, I, I think the books that um, Pete suggested are good. Uh, back to the issue of slavery, uh, Corey Ward asks, is it more accurate to say the intent of race-based chattel slavery was to dehumanize slaves 
but by the, uh, the, uh, the accounts of the enslaved themselves, they maintained their sense of humanity. Because of this resistance, it's difficult for Moynihan to draw a direct line from the effects of slavery as his basis for black brokenness and helplessness. I, I, I'd endorse much of that. That seems to me, that seems to me about right. I think um, Moynihan had the, well, I, I mean, at the risk of, uh, of labeling and, uh, and even a little bit of stereotyping maybe, you know, Moynihan was a very, a, a very interesting, thoughtful guy um, and uh, became in some ways later in his career a little bit of a contrarian. Um, but here you see Moynihan is a, is a good 1960s liberal in, in, in a lot of ways and his solutions are the solutions of 19, his analysis, I should say, and then, uh, and then, and then remedies are, are the ideas of, of 1960s era progressive liberalism at really its, its high watermark of, I mean, this is where it's, uh, it's won a landslide election. Uh, it can do whatever it wants uh, in the, you know, with the majorities in Congress that they have and LBJ as the president. And uh, Moynihan had a faith in programmatic liberalism to, uh, to analyze accurately and address at the level of policy really difficult problems. And it seems to me that that, that faith sometimes turns into a bit of a, a, bit of a blindness. Um, and one of the ways that blindness shows up is the, is the underestimation of the, let me put this in, in Tocquevillian terms of, uh, of, of the need and the, and, the, and the power of institutions of civil society rather than federalized governmental solutions for, for these problems. And he, and he underestimates, I think, um, Black Americans' ability to address the, their, their own problems on their own initiative. Um, boy, there's, there's some really good questions up here. I, I, I'm trying to prioritize because we're, we're running out of time. Um, oh, Joe Rooney asks, how does Moynihan's argument relate to the current deba debate on critical race theory? Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess I would need to know more exactly what Joe means by critical race theory, or do, do you want to, somebody want to offer a definition? Uh, I, yeah, I, right. It's a slippery term. I, I'll yeah, throw yeah. out the, the idea that that uh, racism is absolutely baked into the system, existing independently okay. of the motives of any particular individual. Yeah, I would say Moynihan believed that was true, mm -hmm. and 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 yeah, it just, it's just simply put, he believed that was true. Again, the question is whether the data supports that. Uh, you know, that argument of the data as was available to him or as is available to us now, but Moynihan was, had that view. I guess uh, my, my two cents about that would be that there is some, um, in some sense, Moynihan, um, there's, there's almost a kind of a direct line between the argument that Moynihan makes, and this is, this is the, the phase two um, program and vision of, of Martin Luther King Jr. Almost a direct line between them and, uh, and, and what, what now goes under the name CRT in one sense. And then in another sense, there's a significant um, divergence and the, the, the convergence or the, or the, the, the continuity is, that, is what David said, that Moynihan emphasizes that the problems, it, it, this too is a kind of irony that, um, you know, he, he centers his discussion on the, on the black family. And that leads people to think Moynihan is throwing rocks morally. He's criticizing black culture. He's criticizing black mores. When in fact, I mean, throughout the report, he's, he says over and over and over again, that the condition of the black family is really just a consequence. 
of much larger structural institutional kinds of forces. And so, so far as he emphasizes the, as we call it now, the institutional racism, the structural racism, um, there's a direct line of continuity between, uh, between his vision and, uh, and, and what goes under the name CRT now. On the other hand, the critical part of critical race theory is, uh, is rooted in a philosophic tradition that, that uh, I'm not fully competent to talk about uh, you know, at great length and I'm not going to for purposes of time anyway. But one of the things you find in uh, say the writings of, I mean, the original CRT theorist, uh, Derek Bell and, uh, and others is that there are no transracial neutral principles. There are no natural human rights. There is no set of policies that can somehow apply with equal justice to different racial groups. All visions of justice are racially grounded, are reducible to a kind of racial ideology. So there's no uh, there's no neutral position that can do justice to everybody. That I think is one of the is one of the tenets of uh, of CRT, and that leads to a really profound distrust of uh, of political liberalism. And uh, uh, there, I think Moynihan certainly does not share that view. I mean, I think Moynihan thinks there is such a thing as a common good, and probably thinks there's such a thing as natural human rights. And, uh, and there, there, I think the critical race theorists are, 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 much, more, are much more radical. Uh, we're, uh, of course, rapidly running out of time. I, I want to ask about, the, uh, about the, the results of this. I, I know that just about three months after this report is released, uh, Linda Johnson gives his famous speech at Howard University to fulfill these rights, which I, I have to assume is a, is a direct outcome of this. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the report, it says, well, the policy of the United States is to bring the Negro American to full and equal sharing in the responsibilities and rewards of citizenship. It's a very light on specifics. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what immediately comes to mind is affirmative action. Was, was there more than that, 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 that uh, he had in mind? What, what were the, the specifics that he was looking for? Yeah, there, 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 this led to a whole series of um, programs or urban action programs, you know, in other words, where people would go into uh, um, an African-American neighborhood, live with the people, try to help them organize, whether that meant, um, uh, you, you know, um, politically or, or even economically to start up businesses and things like that. So everything from that to, you know, increased, um, uh, well, you know, the spending that went along with that, but increased uh, efforts to increase enforcement of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil, uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, because now there was some real uh, enforcement power there. So there was a, a host of things and uh, affirmative action, I think, was something that was not, that term, uh, it, you know, calling for equal results didn't specify that affirmative action was the, the one and only way to get there. Right. But, but there's a kind of, uh, you know, there were already, um, uh, that idea was already kind of percolating in the government. Um, Moynihan didn't, didn't invent that for sure. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, the, Two, two things. Let me, um, let me add to uh, something I said about the connection with CRT that occurred to me after I shut my mouth the first time, which is that this emphasis on equal outcomes that's in, uh, that's in the LBJ speech that John was referring to, and it's also in Moynihan's report, um, seems to be based on the premise that the, the, the present socioeconomic disparities, the, the ways in which uh, blacks as a group are disadvantaged in, uh, in, in, in regard to certain socioeconomic goods and ills. Um, the, the premise seems to be that those, those disparities are in themselves unjust and need somehow to be equaled out. That's how we understand, or at least uh, racial progressives understand the term equity these days. This is the, this is the argument of, uh, of Ibram Kendi 
And I think, you know, that that too has its roots in uh, in Moynihan and MLK's phase two thinking and so forth about um, LBJ's what he wants to do uh, to what David said, I would just add, you know, kind of a host of, of welfare programs. He wants to he wants to build, um, as we say, a safety net, um, you know, a pretty broad and inclusive safety net of income support measures, job training measures, all kinds of things, uh, aid to, to public schools, especially in, in urban areas that, uh, that he thinks are gonna contribute to the solution to this. And as for affirmative action, it's just in its embryo in 1967. My understanding of it is that affirmative action as we understand it now, with regard to race, race, the use of race preferences in employment and admissions, um, comes about as a um, as a policy adopted to enforce the 1964 Civil Rights Act, especially especially Title VII, which is the employment discrimination title, um, and it comes out of some thinking by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission which in the beginning is much underfunded and has a, a very quickly a big backlog of cases that they just can't take one by one to judge the justice of complaints of intentional discrimination. And so they decide that they want to address discrimination by considering it statistically. Uh, you know, that's, that's a way of getting rid of the backlog of individual cases. That's a way of trying to formulate policies um, uh, in a much more generalized way. And so once they consider it, they start to consider discrimination as established just by, by statistical outcomes, you know, percentages of blacks employed in this or that, uh, that industry or not employed and so forth, then that pretty quickly turns into uh, a kind of, a, at least a, a, a tacit mandate for, uh, for, for racial preference policies. Wow. What a, what a terrific conversation we've had tonight. We are out of time, unfortunately. I want to thank both of our panelists, David and Peter, as well as uh, to our participants for their terrific questions. Mm -hmm. uh, as a reminder, you'll be receiving an email within the next week. That email will include a link for a certificate of participation. It will also contain a link to the archive webinar. We really hope you will share this uh, the, that link with your colleagues. Get it out there on, on social media. I, I think this, this conversation uh, really deserves to be shared widely. If you've enjoyed tonight's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate, online or in-person graduate course in our Master of Arts of American History and Government program. You can find more information about our course offerings, as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. Our next episode of Documents in Detail, in fact, our final episode of this season, will take place on the evening of Wednesday, May 18th when our topic will be the revolt of 1910 against Speaker of the House Joseph Cannon. Uh, that comes from the core document volume on the US Congress. And here to talk about it with me on that occasion will be Dr. Joseph Pastel of Hillsdale College. Uh, uh, Dr. Pastel is also editor of that volume. And Dr. S Dr. Sarah Burns of the Rochester Institute of Technology. So thanks for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again on May 18th. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.